Hi, welcome to the first part in what is going to end up being a series of webinars. Uh, I, a few months ago, we sent out an email saying that I was going to make a webinar and uh, all of our insiders could ask me que a question. And what we got back was over 200 responses, some with more than 10 questions each. <laughs> I'm going to try and address all of them, but believe me, it, we, it was a, I was absolutely inundated. There's literally weeks of work just trying to sort all the questions and, uh, and uh, figure out the answers and, and uh, make it, you know, now I'm making it into presentations for you. Uh, so we're going, only going to cover, I'm not going to be able to answer all questions, but I'm going to answer uh, a, each question that deals with a specific topic, somebody will get an answer to that topic. So by answering that question, sometimes it answers five other people that basically asked the same question and just phrased it a little differently. Uh, so I'm just going to jump into the questions right away. And uh, DJW, uh, asks, could you explain why it's more important to measure your holdings in ounces as opposed to measuring them in terms of currency value? And there's two really good reasons. One, price doesn't shake you out. If you're looking at how many ounces you have, and we go through a pullback like we've been going through for the past uh, year and a half, two years, uh, you aren't as likely to be shaken out of your position and you don't have the same levels of anxiety that you have at night going, oh man, man I'm 50% down, what am I going to do? I can't sell here. Uh, I've got to wait for it to go up or no, I better sell. And you know, <clears throat> I don't make any specific recommendations, but, but I'm, I hope that most of you have not sold. I know some of you did give up uh, during this pullback. Uh, I personally have not given up. I'm going to be using this to accumulate more. I've been waiting for, uh, to, to see if there's a bottom that is in, and I do believe that there's a bottom in. I'm actually going to purchase some silver uh, tomorrow. Um, so uh, basically price doesn't shake you out, and then ounces sort of determines how much you can buy in the future. Price doesn't really mean anything compared to what it's going to be worth in the future. If we're dividing single family median price home in ounces of gold or silver, or if we're dividing shares of the Dow by ounces of gold or silver, you get a picture of how much uh, paper assets and how much uh, more real estate gold and silver should buy you in the future. You can't determine that with price because we don't know what the future price will be of gold or silver, and we don't know what the price will be of those assets. Uh, Carmine uh, says, can you give a specific, specific examples in history during a currency collapse or hyperinflation of how many ounces of silver it took to buy real estate. Um, yes, I can. All you have to do is go to the Census Bureau, census.gov, and get their data for a single family median price home in 1980 and just divide that by 850, that was uh, the price of gold, or by $50, that was the price of silver. Uh, now you've got to be careful data sets are uh, very different. When you're looking at census data, you have to scroll to the second set of data. The second set is the actual price back in those years. The first set of data on the Census Bureau's website is adjusted to like $2,005 or something like that, or two, two, year $2,000. So if you then take 1980 and divide it by the price of gold, it lies to you. So you've got to be very careful of what data sets you're looking at. Uh, but in my book, I did write about the Weimar hyperinflation. Now, I've heard this story many times. I don't have any uh, first-hand accounts of it. I don't have a newspaper article or anything that, like that to reference to. Mark Faber was the first one that I hear it and Mark hear, heard it from. And Mark Faber has a lot of credibility. And he said that it only took 25 ounces of gold to buy an entire city block of commercial real estate in downtown Berlin at the end of their hyperinflation. Uh, and what they most likely would have used would have been US dollars, which uh, there were a lot of then, and they were backed, it was one of the few currencies that didn't go off the gold standard during World War I, so it was considered as good as gold. So 25 ounces of gold would have bought that entire city block and 
This is commercial real estate. So you're talking two and three story stone buildings in downtown Berlin. So that would take many, many multiple millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to buy in a downtown area, for instance, in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago. That's the type of reference we're making here. Information gets twisted through the years and people exaggerate. Recently I heard somebody say 10 ounces of gold on the internet. And so this same story has now gotten twisted and it's down to 10 ounces. So it may have started out at, at 100 ounces, but still, that's an extreme bargain. It doesn't matter. Gold is going to buy a whole lot more real estate if there's an extreme currency crisis. Now, this presentation is basically uh, that I'm going to make. We haven't gotten to the presentation yet. These are the questions. But it's, it's basically uh, sort of uh, built around Austin's question. Austin was the only guy that came at me with data. And uh, he was sort of scathing in, in some of his uh, question. But it says, uh, please address U.S. home prices in comparison with gold according to this data. And what he was reporting on was some of Robert Schiller's, Dr. Robert Schiller of Yale University, his data uh, divided by the price of gold. It appears that a home may be more undervalued than gold at the present time. And so we're going to get to that in a moment uh, in the charts that I've got assembled. And uh, then uh, some more real estate pertinent questions, because this one's going to center around real estate. Angela, her sixth question to me was, uh, if hedge funds sell their U.S. real estate holdings and um, America experiences a downturn in real estate, how might this impact gold and silver in the short term and in the long run? And I don't know how it'll affect price, and I don't care. What I care about is uh, the ounces becoming more value, valuable compared to real estate. In fact, if the price of silver didn't change from here, but real estate fell to one-tenth of its value, uh, I would be fine with that. I would be cashing in my gold and silver and buying real estate with the proceeds. And that, something like that could happen in a, the most extreme deflation, but I doubt it. Uh, anyway, gold should buy a whole lot more real estate in the future, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. Uh, Garrett uh, had a long question, but what I want to point out is how can I further educate myself. He was saying he's reading books on Austrian school economics and so on. And I think that that is one of the great questions here. Thank you, Garrett, for asking that. And basically, we are uh, doing Hidden Secrets of Money. And uh, please watch those episodes, digest them, send them to friends. Uh, uh, we think that it's really valuable information. And what you're going to see as time goes on is we're going to get more and more into, not centered around gold and silver, but economics and freedom and uh, how this relates to monetary history and, and how it relates to gold and silver. But really, we're facing a crisis point uh, when it comes to uh, freedom and uh, like the United States of America and freedom in the rest of the world. Uh, we've had this uh, tremendous push toward freedom in most countries. Most countries becoming more free. A few, like the United States, have made the decision to become less free. Uh, and this is a, a very worrisome trend. We're seeing countries that were pushing toward freedom starting to pull back right now. Economic crisis very often brings this on. But that is a great question. How can I further educate myself? Uh, keep on buying those books and reading them, but also follow Hidden Secrets of Money. And if you could help us by forwarding it to anybody that you think could benefit from it, we certainly would appreciate it. And then Alan and Anya. Hello, Alan and Anya. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, these are some people that were among our earliest customers. And I used to speak with them on the phone many times. And so I just want to say hello. And we're going to close each one of these segments with uh, somebody where they had a statement that I grouped into a group called These People Get It. And we have no intention of doing anything stupid like selling because we can't see that any fundamentals have changed. If anything, there is even more evidence, more evidence that governments are being reckless, 
more evidence that gold and silver have a sound founda foundation to them. So thank you very much, Elan and Anya. Um, uh, now we're going to get into the presentation. So this one is centered around uh, Austin's question, shouldn't we sell our gold and go into real estate right away? Now, I've always said that people have to do what their heart tells them to do. You've got to do what you think is best for you. The only recommendation that I have ever made to anybody is to get educated. Otherwise, I tell you what I'm doing. I never make any specific recommendations to anybody. I'm going to show you evidence here that real estate is uh, still overvalued compared to gold and why I am going to wait uh, for gold to go to extremes probably on real estate that it hasn't seen for more than a century. There are fundamental reasons why uh, gold should buy you more real estate in the future than it did in 1980. Uh, but what we're going to hear, this is U.S. Census data, and we've just turned it into a chart that starts in 1963, and it, the chart goes along, and you can see the bubble uh, that developed and then popped in 89 to 90, uh, 90, it crashed by 92, and 93, 4, 5, and 6, real estate sort of sat down on the bottom, and you had like three or four years where you could make up your mind and you could go shopping for a home. And on a national average back then, real estate cash flow, investment real estate, like single family median priced homes, on a national average cash flowed at 10%. This is the type, of this. so that means that you would have been able, if you were a good shopper, to go out and find homes and then rent them and make 20% more in your monthly payment than you're gonna be paying for the bank payment and the insurance on that home. So that, those times are when to go and get your real estate. And then we go along this sort of average trend line and we go into the biggest bubble in history, biggest bubble in all of history, and it finally bursts and we go uh, back down to the trend line and bounce back into a bubble according to this data. Now this is U.S. Census data. Uh, Robert Schiller has uh, the Case Schiller Real Estate Index and there are several different data sets. He's got a 20-city index, uh, but it doesn't go back very far. Uh, this is based on his uh, index that goes all the way back to the year 1890. So I love this stuff, because I love historic reference. And uh, the, uh, this is based, though, on just four cities, and none of them are really major cities. You have uh, well, Chicago's a major city, but you've got Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, and Oakland. If he had included uh, any of major cities like New York, Los Angeles, or San Francisco instead of Oakland, for instance, or uh, any of the major cities in Florida, or if Las Vegas was in here, this would look very, very different. If he was just doing a national average, it would look very, very different. But it's good data and it goes back a long way. That's the reason I love it, this historical reference. Now, one thing I noticed is um, it gets very choppy back here. So I'm suspecting that the data, you know, this is the best data that we have in the world that Robert Schiller has put together. Yet, it's probably got a degree of inaccuracy that increases the further back in time you go. So I'm imagining that after a severe undervaluation like this, once the soldiers came back from World War II, this is actually probably a bubble if you could get the proper data, you know, a whole national average. Uh, nobody was keeping data ben back then, so you, he probably had to go through newspaper articles and stuff to get all of this. Uh, but then the data becomes quite smooth and probably fairly accurate, and what you notice is you go into a bubble and then you visit undervaluation. Bubble, undervaluation. I do want to point out that the 19, in 1980, when gold peaked, we were coming off of a minuscule, tiny bubble. Uh, this is the bubble that popped in 89 and gave us the undervaluations uh, all through the early 90s. Uh, then we go into the greatest bubble in history. There is nothing that you can compare this to. This is uncharted territory. The bubble burst and we went down back to fair value and bounced. It has not visited undervalued territory yet. 
The free market requires this to go to a greater undervaluation than when these other bubbles popped. And like I said, this data probably, as it goes back, becomes less and less accurate, and it is only based on four cities. But my guess is that there's a bubble here, and it pops and goes undervalued. This was probably a little bubble. It popped and went undervalued. This bubble was probably a little higher, and this undervaluation a little bit lower. But it's basically a mean. And the more it gets out of whack, the more it has to overshoot to the opposite extreme. I'm looking for an area where we've got to go and correct all of these excesses. There was too much inventory built when homes got too expensive. There were too many people that jumped into this industry when homes got too expensive. The market requires that it goes undervalued for people to finally give up on some of those jobs and find a job in a different sector, for people to, uh, uh, for banks to finish unloading this shadow inventory of homes. Uh, so anyway, now we're going to take a look at Robert Schiller's home price index divided by the price of gold. So this is the, w one of the um, sets of data that Austin was uh, uh, asking about. So this is, the, this is the value. I've inverted this data so that when this is rising, it's gold going up. Uh, so it's gold measured in real estate instead of real estate measured in gold. And here you have the 1980 high, and then it went very undervalued in the year uh, 1999 to 2000. And then uh, this is showing gold being overvalued compared to real estate. And then it looks like we missed the top. Oh, darn. Uh, but you have to really be, uh, you have to look into the data. You've got to download the spreadsheet that's behind the data, and you've got to look at the data and determine what it is. Robert Schiller's index uh, uses uh, quarterly data. So his 1980 high for gold is $548. So if you believe that that was the high, then this data is correct. Uh, what we did, though, is we went back and we plugged in the actual high, daily highs for 1980 and for uh, 2011. And when you correct it from quarterly average, to where gold and silver actually, actually peaked. So at $548, it took 118 ounces of gold to buy a single family median price home in the United States. This peak was at 129. Yes, they're very close together. But now let's correct the data. And we have 88 ounces of gold and 119. This is a much, much larger spread. It's a big percentage. Uh, there's another reason that I'm going to get to in a minute that I did not believe that this was the top and there was no way, no possible way that I would sell my gold and go into real estate. Uh, but now we're down at 185. Well, what is this? This is just, there's a pullback in nine, from 1970, first day of 1975 until September of 76. Gold fell from two, almost 200 bucks an ounce to 103. And so it, it it almost hit 200 and it rolled over. It was 35 back here. And so measured in real estate, the price is lower on real estate, less ounces of gold to buy a single family median price up here. It's, it's more expensive here. This is 3,300. So uh, right here would be about 3,000 ounces of gold down off the bottom of the chart. Um, so we're just going through that same pullback. And I don't know if I've got a video talking about it, but I'm, I can guarantee you, you can talk to a whole lot of people. I have been expecting this pullback. And when we had the crash of 08, I said, this is not it. This is not the pullback that, uh, that is similar to this uh, uh, 75 and 6 pullback. That flushed out a lot of people. The crash of 08, everybody started buying. It was not the same thing. What we needed in this bull market was a cyclical bear inside a secular bull. So we have a secular bull market, and inside there, there's something that is, is going to shake investors out, rattle their confidence, cause them to give up. This is required for this market to be healthy. And if you want it to go a long time and gold to go to really high valuations, you need that. If this just went into a blow-off top right now, uh, you wouldn't see these great gains that I've been talking about, this greatest wealth transfer in history. 
it's still out there. Look at where gold went after that pullback. Let's take that and move that over here. This is more what I'm expecting. I, I said in, my, uh, in a video, uh, and I believe in my book also, that I'm expecting that you'll probably see a single family medium price home for 50 ounces of gold or less. And that is exactly what I'm looking for, that same percentage size move now that we've finished this pullback. And I do believe that we're in, the bottom is either in or we're gonna go down and retest it one more time. But I believe that it's in. So why do I want to wait for this to go way up here? Why am I so certain that that's going to happen? You just had the biggest bubble in, in history and it hasn't reached undervaluation yet. It needs to do that. So compared to gold, real estate will fall. This is a year over year price change. It's more complex to understand, but in years where this line is above zero, the price of real estate is going up. In years where it's below zero, the price of real estate is falling. And uh, this is real home price, so it's inflation adjusted home prices. And so what I see here though, is ever since 71, these oscillations are getting wilder and wilder, and I'm expecting something that's going to go way off the bottom of the chart down here because we just came off the biggest bubble in history. This is the dead cat bounce that we've been experiencing where uh, real estate hit fair value right there, and now we're in that dead cat bounce. Uh, and so here's uh, the Schiller's home price measured in silver and the 1980 high and where we are today. And I, so I am expecting uh, that it'll be 500 ounces of silver or less. You know, a case of silver eagles will buy you a single family medium price home at the peak. Why am I expecting that? Again, the severe undervaluation that, uh, the severe undervaluation that real estate has to visit once it comes off the bubble and we have not yet seen that. And then Austin also talked about the Hunt brothers trying to corner the market and driving silver up to $50 and you can't rely on that. I interviewed Jeff Christian of CPM Group and he's one of the world's authorities on the precious metals sector. And uh, he basically said that the Hunt brothers added 75 cents to a buck to the price of silver at the most. I absolutely agree with him. In fact, I wrote an article, uh, we'll try and put the link up here, about the Hunt Brothers and how they are actually responsible for capping the price of gold. Uh, they were actually honest, uh, they honestly believed that the dollar was gonna go to zero. They were buying silver to protect them, not to necessarily speculate and corner the market. This is the Dow Gold Ratio. You've seen this a few times. This is one of our indicators of when to sell. And we have a fair valuation in this green band where gold's value is fair and, it's un and anything below that, it's undervalued compared to paper assets, stocks. Again, I've inverted this uh, graph uh, so that uh, it took 50, uh, 45 ounces of gold to buy one share of the Dow there and we're working up toward probably a half ounce. But this is the fair value. This is my caution band. When gold's price is one third uh, the points on the Dow, at that point, I will be watching things very, very carefully, trying to decide when I'm going to sell my position uh, and how much of it and how I'm going to ease out. The strategies will get more and more refined as we get to that point. Once we get past two, in other words, gold's price being half the points of the Dow, uh, that's where it peaked in the Great Depression it peaked at one, there was a day in 1980 where the price of gold and the points on the Dow were the same. But again, you're looking at wilder and wilder swings. This peak here uh, in 29 and 32, gold was $20.67 an ounce, it was fixed. This is only stocks moving. Then in 1966, uh, the Dow hit its head on 1,000 points and bounced sideways for uh, until 1982. So basically the Dow was fixed and this is gold moving only. This time, both are moving simultaneously. This is going to be a much larger event. It's more volatile. It's going to try and shake people out. My job, and I figured this out back in 2002, 
was to get on this bull and not let it buck me off of its back. So I believe that you are going to see gold going up toward a half ounce, another, uh, a half a share of the Dow. Another, or a half ounce required to buy a share of the Dow. That means the gold's price will be double the points on the Dow. For real estate to be uh, undervalued compared to gold right now would at least require this to be in this green zone somewhere or above. Uh, this is, for me, proof positive that the gold real estate ratio is not telling me to get out of my gold and into real estate. We still have, a, this was just the 74 pullback all over again, or 75 pullback. Uh, silver gold ratio, this is one of the confirming indicators that you wanna use, to, and it's gonna flash a signal, and you're going to see uh, silver's value rise to above 1 20th of gold's value, probably less than 1 15th of gold's value, and this is the, one of the confirming indicators that we're using. We have a basket of indicators. There are quite a number of them at this point. I've been developing them over the past several years. And there are the, the Dow real estate, I mean the gold real estate, Dow gold, and the gold silver ratio as a confirming indicator are some of the primary ones that I've been telling people about. The others are proprietary because if you tell too many people about them, they stop working and I want them to work, so we're keeping them a secret. It's a service that we do for you insiders. Now, this is the price of silver, and this is the price of gold, so silver is listed on this side and gold is listed on that side. And here's the peak in April of 2011 for silver, and here's the peak in uh, uh, September of 2011 for gold. This is not the way a precious metals bull market ends. That was a greed-driven mania. This was a greed-driven mania. And so it just, uh, th these, uh, these were not bubbles, but these um, gold and silver got overbought when they went, started to go parabolic like this. Uh, that's uh, usually a sign that there's going to be a pullback. And this is just a pullback, a dip on their way up to their eventual destinies. But when, if you look at 1980, uh, you're going to see that uh, silver peaked, I believe it was on a Friday, January 19th at $50. Uh, and then at the open, uh, the, the COMEX changed the rules uh, because of the Hunt brothers. And it was liquidation orders only, so basically you couldn't make a new futures contract. You could only close out old ones. So basically it's a, a rule that says until this rule is lifted, the price of silver will go down. That was the rule. Monday morning, uh, it op the exchange opens up with a gap down and uh, the price of gold peaked shortly thereafter and went down. In a fear-driven panic, which is the end of a, the third phase of a precious metals bull, should be a fear-driven panic. These are going to peak on the same day, or at the most, one day apart. This is not how it ends, it's not over with. So I wanna thank you all for these questions because uh, some of them actually challenged me and, uh, and were actually quite a bit of work <laughs> to answer. But this is, is the major evidence here that you've, you've seen all the measurements against other stuff in society. This measures emotion. And markets are driven on greed and fear. And these were two separate, separated by many months of time, uh, greed-driven tops. They weren't a fear-driven panic when people are trying to get out of paper currency. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.